Jesus is a man of tremendous credibility. People of all stripes admire him greatly. Central to his message was who he was and what he came to do. And he offered a unique plan of salvation to humanity. You cannot avoid the fact that Jesus was, was not a pluralist, he was not an inclusivist, he was an exclusivist. It was what he taught and what he taught those who followed him to teach as well. This is what motivates what Christians call the Great Commission. This is why Christians are a missionary, uh, missionary people and Christianity is a missionary religion. Now there's a reason Jesus said this. It wasn't just hubris, it wasn't just arrogance. It's because he was the one who had the right take on the problem and provided the singular solution. The problem wasn't that there weren't good people in the world or weren't sincere people in the world or people who even wouldn't believe the right things. The problem was, regardless of those other things, every human being failed to keep God's law as they ought to have kept it. And therefore, they are many times over criminals in his court. And God's justice requires punishment for that. God's mercy is demonstrated by becoming a man in the person of Jesus. And Jesus steps into the dock in our place. And he says to the judge, his father, I will take the punishment on their behalf. Let them go. And he takes the full force of God's anger against our sin upon himself, which then becomes the grounds for forgiveness. Now we have a choice. God is not looking down at the world at different religious clubs, the Muslim club, the Christian club, the Jewish club, the Hindu club, and he's not saying, you know, I like the Christian club better to hell with the rest of you, quite literally. No, he's looking down at humanity who is desperately wicked compared to his standards, who desperately needs to be rescued. And he offers a pardon and he gives people an opportunity to either accept it or reject it. If we accept it, the pardon is in Jesus, his son. If we accept those terms, then we fall under the mercy that is provided through Jesus. If we don't, then we stand as we think we desire on our own two feet before God and we fend for ourselves. But that will not be a pretty picture because if we were real honest with ourselves, we'd realize how terribly we've disappointed God in what he's wanted. That's the choice that's put before us. Jesus gave me every reason to trust what he had to say. It's, it's not a leap of faith. It's a step of trust based on good, solid information. And this is why you know, the apostles weren't speaking out of the top of their head when they kept referring back to the things Jesus did. The book of Acts starts with the statement, these are things that Jesus did with many convincing proofs. Those things are available if people want to, uh, want to find out about them. Uh, I feel uncomfortable with uh, uh, the way of answering, say, the problem of evil by saying, well, free will is necessary because if there was no free will, there couldn't be any love. We would just be machines, and machines don't love. And so there's this equation between free will and love. Now, notice the way free will is characterized, though. It's tied in with the problem of evil and moral actions. That is, unless we have, and this is one characterization of freedom, the ability to do otherwise. We could be good or we could be bad. If we didn't have the ability to be good or to be bad, the ability to do otherwise, then we wouldn't have the kind of freedom that is necessary for true love to be expressed. Okay, I have a question. Does God display genuine love? Yes. Second question, does, does God have the ability to do otherwise where morality comes in? Can God do evil? No. Will we be able to do evil in heaven? I don't think so. Most people don't think so. We will be immutably good at that point. Does this mean that heaven is going to be bereft of love because now we can't choose to do evil? No, obviously it's going to be thick with love. And God is fully love. He defines love. He's the ground of love, yet he is not capable of evil. This is why I think it's a mistake to kind of tie the free will ability to do evil question in with the ability to love. Because if that works, then God can't be loving because he can't be evil. 
You can't choose evil. And there's not going to be any love in heaven. Obviously, this doesn't work. What would a world without evil, pain, and suffering be like? Uh, it would be like heaven. But I have to offer this qualifier. Heaven is going to be a completely different kind of place because there has been a world of evil, pain, and suffering than it would have been if there were none of those things. Now, this is hard to grasp for, grasp for some people, and, I, and, I, and for some it's not even that compelling. But let me just offer the thought. There are certain moral goods that can be produced in a world that is fallen, that has sin and pain and suffering, uh, that could not be produced in a world that never had those kinds of things. Is it a virtue to persevere under evil and unjust punishment? Sure it is, but that kind of thing couldn't happen in a non-fallen world. There are moral goods like patience and perseverance and, 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 uh, and other virtues like that, that that could only be produced in a fallen world. And in fact, I think this is a big part of the, of the whole issue of pain and suffering. God is using these kinds of things. And again, I don't have the whole picture, but it's a piece of the puzzle. God is using these kinds of things in the lives of people to make them much better individuals than they could ever be, to build virtues in their lives that could not have been built in other ways. Now, this doesn't always happen with everybody that goes through pain and suffering, partly because they don't respond properly to it. Uh, people could get bitter and angry and depressed and and shake their fist against God. I mean, that would be a way of responding. And what? guess what? They never gain anything good from that. But you don't have to be a religious person to realize that going through some of the most difficult times in your lives has turned out to bear the greatest fruit in your life of virtue somewhere down the line. That's what I'm talking about. What is pain? Pain is a, uh, is, is a physiological response. Physical pain is a physiological response to threat of injury. So is pain a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's a good thing. Pain is part of the design of the universe. God put pain in the universe for a good purpose. Now, is there excess? Yes, and there are problems with the fall and all of that. But what I don't, I'd want to be careful of doing is kind of characterizing all pain as bad. I don't think pain is bad. Um, and, and, and so this, this is what makes the problem of, I think there was pain even before the fall. Because the fall didn't design pain, I guarantee you that. It didn't design receptors in my skin. God designed those things. It's a signal. Now, something happened, of course, with the fall, but it's harder to characterize what actually happened with the fall, especially as it touches on the issue of natural evil. Because tsunamis happen because of earthquakes, and earthquakes happen because of the shifting of the Earth's crust. And this is a design feature <laughs> to recycle. So... Would there never have been any earthquakes if there had been no fall? I'm not going to say that. And that's why I think this becomes much more tricky. If you're going to design a world a certain way, there are certain things that turn out to be parts of the package that can't be avoided because of the nature of what you've designed. And paint, pain, pain, and pain is part of that. It's a good thing, but then it has this other side, you know. I mean, I'd be, it would be interesting discussion just to figure out what was bad about that. If it's my house, okay, yeah, I feel bad. Well, just because I feel bad doesn't mean the thing was bad. Well, I lost my home. Okay, maybe I can get another home. I'm, I'm not sleeping in the street. There are provision for that, okay. But I lost a material good. I didn't like that. Yeah, but that doesn't make it bad. And so I think it's, and it's going to be hard to figure out what's going on there because we're deeply influenced by values in our materialist society that, oh my gosh, they don't have running water. I lived in Thailand for eight months, for seven months, and I worked in a Cambodian refugee camp. And it was really funny when people from uh, outside would come and visit the refugee camp hospital, and there they had metal bed frames and a piece of plywood that the people would lay on. And they were thinking, oh my gosh, these poor people, they're laying on plywood. What a tragedy. But these people were living it up because they'd, otherwise they'd be sleeping on the ground. And I don't even know what's wrong with sleeping on the ground, for goodness sake. We have a certain cultural value that 
make certain things tragic when in fact they're not tragic at all.